Genesis 26, 18 tells us Isaac dug again the wells of Abraham. In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. Let's get into what's happening at Azusa Street Revival. A little history. Azusa Street Revival was considered to happen, started April 9th, 1906, and went through a little discussion on how long it lasted, but pretty much to 1915. Uh, it was over. So for those years, there was something happening there at Azusa. Some say it ended more like uh, 1910. Anyway, regardless, that's, that's about the time frame it is. Now remember, 1906, in your history books, there was the great earthquake in California. Yeah, so as that great disaster is going on, you've got this great outpouring that God's pouring out on His people over here on the left-hand side of the, of the city. It's wonderful. It's marvelous to see what God was doing at Azusa Street. But there's a lot of history about Azusa Street that you have to understand before we actually get into the signs and wonders and miracles that actually happen. You need to understand where it all started. And you have to understand where the name Azusa actually comes from. Azusa is actually a name that is Indian. It's an Indian word. You know what it means? Blessed miracle. Isn't that amazing? I never knew that until we just discovered that in some research. Blessed miracle is what, it's, what, it, what it means. And actually, it was first noted by a guy in 1769, Father Juan Crespi. Now, he was referring to an Indian village that he found there in the San Gabriel Canyon, what we now know as Los Angeles. He found this little village that was called Azusa. And it was actually named after a girl, an Indian girl that was named Coma Lee. Now, Coma Lee... Uh, was not your ordinary girl there in the village that she was in. She was considered uh, quite unusual. She walked around and would pray and heal people and they would get well. And um, she had quite the reputation. But she fell in love with a guy. And this guy was part of the chief's family. And she wasn't really on that side of the track. She was on the other side of the track, so to speak. So as this happened... During the time of their romance, as you say, uh, the chief who did not like her said, absolutely not because she's not of royalty or of their line. Um, the chief got sick and he became gravely ill and little uh, Coma Lee came and prayed for him. Now, it's interesting, he did not ho know who she was when she came and prayed for him. He went to sleep that night. Um, he woke up the next day absolutely well, 100% well. And when he found out who it was, he gave his son permission to marry her because she had gotten well. So uh, as that happened, he renamed her to Azusa because she was a blessed miracle. And that was her name. They actually eventually named the, the village Azusa. She had a reputation. If you need healing, there was a phrase they said, Go to, he, go to Azusa and be healed. Go to Azusa. That was what was said. Azusa for healing. Who knew? 1769. And then here we are again in 1906, what God was about to do. When you talk about Azusa Street Revival, there are two names that should come to everyone's mind. One name is you've heard, and that's William J. Seymour. Now, William Seymour uh, was born... Um, back in 1820, I believe, and William Seymour, no, 1870, May 2nd, 1870. Now, William Seymour was born, he was the son of slaves. And even though as, as he was born, uh, you know, the slave trade had ended, but they continued to work on the plantation. Um, he, as his life grew up, even though they were slaves, his mom and dad, he, he started to understand the the vastness of the slave culture and what that really meant to him personally, he came to the conclusion that there was only one real way to be free, only one real way to be free, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
He absolutely knew that. So you know, and when you, when you understand that in history, that he was already a believer, he must have had a praying mom and dad that believed God for him because he knew the only real way to be liberated was to be free in Jesus, and he was, he was that man. Well, even though slavery had ended, there was still a lot of racial tension. There was a lot of prejudice that was there, and he could be in some places and not in others. In fact, you know, in my own life, I grew up in the 60s, the early 60s, and I understood um, living in the state of Georgia, we had a lot of, uh, there was a lot of still stuff left over from, from the old days. I mean, there were places you couldn't, that uh, blacks couldn't go where whites went. They had to go to certain restrooms and not. Now, not a whole lot by then, but there were some places that still felt that way. And there were definitely a large segment of the population felt that way. And, uh, and it wasn't until, you know, we've actually grown past a lot of that. And, you know, we still have issues in our nation when it comes to racism and racial inequality and just issues. And I don't want to spend too much time getting over in that, but understand that William Seymour had those issues that he had to deal with. Um, Frank Bartleman was the other gentleman's name. Now, Frank Bartleman is a guy that you have to understand. Frank was not, uh, he wasn't the glossy front guy. Not at all. In fact, the truth is, if, if William Seymour was, and he was, the un, unquestioned leader of the Azusa Street Revival, then um, you can say that Frank Bartleman was the unquestioned intercessor. Frank Bartleman had struggled, and he had a burning desire to know God. And as he did this, and he learned in prayer, he totally searched high and low to see what God was doing and really wanted an encounter with God long before uh, Azusa Street Revival ever happened or even Bonnie Bray. That was to come later. But he was a man absolutely compelled to find Jesus and compelled to see what God was going to do. Now, um, while William Seymour was born in Louisiana, um, you know... Well, let me go back to William Seymour. You know, as he was growing up, he's a black man. He contracts smallpox and he loses sight in one eye. So he's, he's a one-eyed black man in a, in a nation that has some racial problems still. So as, as he went through understanding what was going on as a black man, at the same time, you have Frank Bartleman. Now, Frank, um, you know, in fact, let me pick up with a story here with Frank. I'm going to skip his childhood. In April 8, 1904, Frank heard a guy preach, F.B. Meyer, that's M-E-Y-E-R. F.B. Meyer was the man that he heard preach. And the, what was so interesting and notable about F.B. was the fact that he had been to Wales. Remember, the Welsh Revival broke out in 1904. So this is right at, this is still, this is going on. So he hears what's going on in Wales. He goes over there. He takes part in the revival and is able to see what's really happening. So he is absolutely riveted by hearing uh, Pastor Meyer or Reverend Meyer preach on revival fires. Does that sound familiar, revival fires? Revival fires. And he understood that while you may not have been the person that started the revival fire, you can carry the flame. And that's the word I want you to get today. And that's actually, in essence, our theme of what we carry about here at Revival Radio TV. You can carry the flame. He understood that just because it was going on in Wales didn't mean it had to die there. He could carry that flame back to the United States. And that's what he did. He searched high and low and wanted to see what God would do if he carried that flame. He, in fact, people said he was so consumed with seeking God that he was, his own family was concerned about him. He didn't eat much. He didn't, he didn't take the time to really delve into family life like he probably should have. He was just so compelled to seek God and see what God was going to do. In fact, it was said he was a fiery preacher. But you know that's in the Bible? Actually, let me look over here. Psalm 104. Psalm 104 verse 4 says, Who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. <laughs> so there you go. Are you a flaming fire? A flaming fire is what Frank Bartleman wanted to be, and he was destined to be that. 
So let's pick up the story. June 17th of that year, he goes to L.A. to attend the First Baptist Church. Now, the First Baptist Church, I bet you didn't know the First Baptist Church was involved in the Great Awakening at Azusa, did you? It was. Pastor Smale was, was, the, uh, was the pastor there. Joseph Smale, pastor, and Joseph Smale was doing the same thing. Now, I think it's interesting here that Smale himself had also returned from Wales and had seen what God had done, and he was interested in bringing that to his church. He didn't know, and I think that's, uh, that's a key here. They did not know what they were asking God to do. They didn't know, oh, God, show up so we can have the baptism in the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues. And They didn't understand all that. Remember, the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit with Charles Parham had just, had just really just happened not long ago, and it hadn't gotten everywhere, it hadn't spread everywhere at this point. But he, he, all he knew is that he wanted more of God and he wanted his people. So Frank Bartleman goes to church there with, at Joseph Smale's church, and he's, he's appalled. When he walks in, he's sitting there, and they're not doing anything. The congregation is just sitting there. Then he found out he was discouraged by the fact, this simple fact, no one did anything until Joseph Smale showed up. They wouldn't even pray. They wouldn't do anything. They would just sit back and wait and watch and wait for him to lead everything. You see, there's a, there's a point that we all have to understand, and that's that we have a responsibility for revival. You know, since we started this TV program, we've, you know, people talk to me, and they, Pastor George calls me revival man, and, and that's, that's good. But, you know, I have people say, well, what have you discovered? What's the key to revival? The key to revival is very simple. It has to start with you. It has to be a personal revival first. You know, last, last week I was with Todd White, and as he was doing what Todd White does, you know, what a great evangelist, what he preaches on is personal revival. And I thought, wow, this is exactly why People get motivated to see God and see what's happening. He's a modern-day revivalist. You wouldn't think of him that way, but he's bringing you to a personal revival with Jesus himself. And you have to do that. Before you can affect others, you have to, it has to affect you. Have you ever heard somebody preach on something or even a teacher teach on something um, that they didn't really know, that they were just repeating words or just memorized their message or memorize their, their course that they were teaching, um, that isn't, down, it's not genuine. And when it's not genuine, when you share it, odds are the people aren't going to receive it. They're going to hear you, and if it's a class, they're going to make notes and pass the course, but they're not going to take that away. They're not going to carry the flame of that because there's no flame there. It's just data. And that's why we have to carry the flame as we go through what we're going through in our day, in our time, to be able to carry and see what God wants you to do and be that personal revival that, uh, that you can see happening. You know, Brother Copeland, you know, when you're around him um, and, you're, and he's been away and he's come back and he's ready for a meeting, you know, most of us are usually like this. We're like, okay, here he comes. What's he gonna, what's he gonna bring us today? And it's because you know that Brother Copeland has spent time in the Word he spent time praying. He's got direction from God, and he's going to deliver a message. And he's going to deliver a message that he got from God, not just something he pulled out of thin air. Amen? I know you know I'm right. But you're sitting there, and you're ready to receive because you know the history of what he's done, who he is, and how he's going to minister that. That's why it's important for you to be genuine in your walk with God. There, were a lot, there have been a lot of not genuine people, not genuine pastors, not genuine uh, church workers or evangelists, and they were just out to do the, the wrong thing. And maybe they had good intentions, but they weren't doing it the right way. They were taking shortcuts. Don't take a shortcut into what God's called you to do. The minute you take a shortcut is the minute you derail and you start down a path of failure. And it will happen when you take a shortcut. It may not be right away, but it will happen. Okay, that part was for free. Let's pick up. Joseph Smale was there. He was, the people, uh, Bartleman was discouraged at his church because nobody was paying attention. Nobody was there. Uh, they wouldn't do anything. They were just sitting back. I just kind of pictured them sitting there like this, waiting for the pastor to show up. Okay, 
motivate me. Get me fired up. Do you know anybody like that in your church? Are you like that? <laughs> you know, that you just sit back and go, okay, feed me, do something. See if you can get me excited. He was mad. He was upset about that because that's not what it was about. He was seeking God. No one had to tell him to seek God. He was so enraptured with it and encapsulated by it. He had to see what God wanted next. And he knew there was going to be a great outpouring, but he didn't know, uh, he didn't know what it was or how to get there, but he knew there was more. And I know you know what I'm saying. Sometimes we just know there's more. There's got to be more than what I have right now, and that's what I want. And that's where Frank Bartleman was at. Now, remember, this is all before Azusa broke out. So Bartleman writes a letter to Evan Roberts, and he says, please help us. What, you know, pray for California. Pray for, uh, for us that we can see God move in a way that we haven't seen before. And miraculously, Evan Roberts gets his letter, and he writes him back. And I want to read you the directions. And I want you to write this down. In fact, we'll put it on the screen so you can see it. And he, because this is so crucial, what Evan Roberts said to Frank Bartleman about revival and how to get that. So, all right, you ready? Here it is. <clears throat> this was what he said. He, he exhorted him and he said, Congregate the people together who are willing to make a total surrender. So, take the opposite of that is don't hang around people that don't want to make a surrender. Congregate the people together who are willing to make a total surrender. Next, pray and wait. Then, believe God's promises and hold daily meetings. Now, let's break that down. Congregate the people together who are willing to make a total surrender. You know, it's important who you hang out with. It's important who you're with and how you, who you interface with. You know, and I know this, when you were growing up, your, your parents probably said, or whoever you was in charge, your grandmothers, you know, be careful who you hang around with. Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> and I've heard that, you know, and so you have to be careful who you're with. Well, in spiritual things, that this same thing applies. You've got to be aware of who you're with because it, you don't need negative influence. You don't need the bad to overweigh what good God's doing in your life. So that was the first thing. Uh, be sure you, you're around the same people who have total surrender to God. Next, he was uh, pray and wait. Now, I thought that was interesting that he wrote pray and wait. Pray and see God move. No, pray and wait. So what he was saying is there was a wait. Now, if you go back to the Welsh revival, if you remember, <clears throat> Evan Roberts prayed and was seeking God for quite a while before the great outpouring happened. So there was a time. He doesn't say you got to wait a long time necessarily, but there is a time of waiting, waiting on God and seeing what happens. That doesn't mean you sit back and kick back and just relax. No, pray and wait. And I thought the next thing he said um, was crucial to praying and waiting, and that was believing God's promises. Believing God's promises, because if we believe God's promises when we pray and wait, we know that He's going to fulfill our promises our request to know Him farther, further and farther than we have before. Then, the last thing He said, hold daily meetings. Now, holding daily meetings, why is that important? It's important for a couple of reasons. One, people need to be together. You know, you can't just meet somebody on the street and let's say you know they're a Christian and instantly be best friends. No, best friends aren't hap don't happen uh, just off the cuff. That's a, 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 that relationship has to sit there. It has to develop. And pretty soon, and even if you're married, it's with your spouse. And the more you're with that person, the more you start to understand them. You know how they think and you know how they operate. And when you're together, there's almost a communication that can happen <clears throat> without you even having to talk about it. You know what I mean? I know you do. Well, having daily meetings is getting that same body together. You're spending time seeking God together. Forsake not the fellowship of, the, of you together, of your members. So he's doing that and he's saying get together so that you can corporately worship God and corporately seek God to do what he wants to do in your, in your body. So we're praying and waiting. We're believing God's promises to do it. And then we're congregating together and we're doing it on a daily basis. Now you can say, well, what about, 
you know, our church doesn't have a daily meetings and we're not about to start that anytime real soon. Well, that's okay. You know, that'll come. Does not mean that you can't, if it's just you, if it's just you and your family or you and a friend, do it. Do it. Make an effort. Make a sacrifice, which it really will not be a sacrifice once you understand the power of what you're doing. When you're seeking God, you are investing everything you have into your relationship with God. And I don't know of a better relationship to invest in than that, than to invest in your relationship with God. Spend that time with Him and see what He's going to do. This, this, redder, this, redder, this letter just absolutely excited uh, Bartleman, and he took it to heart, and, he, and it just ignited him further. In fact, Frank Bartleman was so um, enraptured in, what he, in seeking God to do something that his family actually, they wanted him to see a doctor because they felt like he was, maybe he was starting to lose it. In fact, there are some folks that said he was losing his mind because they, it, what had started at that time, he had started praying for a Welsh-type revival. God, please pour out a Welsh revival here like what they got in Wales. We want what's over there here. He stopped praying that way, and he started praying as, now this is interesting, the further he got into praying for a revival, the further he got into the mind of Christ. He said, God, give us a second Pentecost. We want a second Pentecost here. Ah, a much better way to pray, isn't it? That he was seeking God for another Pentecost. He was visiting, while well, he visited Smale's church there several times, here's what he said of what to pray for, and I want to bring that up. He was led to pray for these several things, and these are worth noting. Number one, pray for faith. Pray for discernment of spirits, healing, and prophecy. So those are the four. Faith, discernment of spirits, healing, and prophecy. Now, isn't it interesting that discernment of spirits is, is right up there? Now, wh why is that so important? <clears throat> in any church service, any meeting, um, you know that you know that there's a battle just to get to them, just to get, <laughs> just to get to the service. Some days it's a battle, you know, with issues at home or the car won't start or whatever. But when you're there, you're not off the hook. The spirits that drive men sometimes are not the ones that we want to be around. So to be able to discern spiritual activity allows you to know what God wants to do. Keeping aware of what may be trying to come into the room. I remember traveling with Pastor Benny and uh, we would be overseas and, and great miracle services and meetings happen and right at a very crucial point in the message, you know, someone would start whooping and hollering and, and you know, acting crazy up, way up in the bleachers somewhere or in the audience. Now, some of these, we, there were 500,000 people at or a million people and even more in some of his meetings he continued to have. So you're trying to figure out who is that and suddenly now I'm not looking at what the man is saying on the podium. I'm trying to figure out who is that over there that's you know, going ballistic in the stands or wh where's that noise coming? I've taken my focus off of what God's doing and I've got it on man. Well, that spirit that's doing that is that's his goal. Get you off of what God's doing and start looking at something over here in the natural enough that it'll get you away from receiving God's word. Discerning of spirits and Benny would, Pastor Benny would obviously call them down and the ushers would take them out. Now there's a difference time. There's a difference between that type of situation and someone just being blessed in a healing line or something. And this is why you have to discern them. You have to know which is which. Is that a demonic activity or is that this person's having an encounter with God? It's something we have to do. So we're going to stop right there with our story. That's all the time I have today. But listen, I want you to take this from it. Remember what he prayed for. Pray for faith, discernment of spirits, healing, and prophecy. And let's go back and, and let me reread what he said in my notes here. You know, all these notes are available, by the way. If you want to download the show notes, all this is in much more detail. Uh, just go there to the website and you can download that for free, no charge. For free. We want to get this in you so that you can have another Pentecost where you're at. Um, so 
as he was, this is what Evan Roberts said. That's what I was wanting to read. What Evan Roberts said, congregate people together who are willing to make a surrender, pray and wait, believe God's promises and hold daily meetings. So why don't you make that, let me challenge you with that in these last two minutes. I challenge you to do that. Spend time with him every day. Hold those daily meetings, if even it's just yourself to bring, usher in that Pentecost that you want to see in your life. The very fact that you're watching this program says that there's a hunger. There's some level of hunger that you have that you want to see God move in your own life, if not your family and your, your church and your city. So that's good. So what are you going to do? You're going to have daily meetings. Whether they're, If they're only by yourself, then have that meeting with God. You're going to pray you're going to, and, you're, and you're going to wait and see what God does. But in your waiting, you're going to believe God's promises. Believing God's promises is the, oh, yes, He really is. He's here. He's going to make sure that all this happens. Thank you, Father. I'm just going to wait here, and I'm ready, and I'm looking for every opportunity. So as you go through this week, remember, your own personal revival is up to you. Don't be like the people in Joseph Smale's church that just waited on the pastor to do everything. Don't be like those that were just sitting there, refused to pray until the pastor prayed. Because when you do that, you're putting your religion or your salvation in another man's hands, and it's not where it should belong. It belongs in yours and your relationship with the Father. Remember this. Be the one. Be the one that takes your own personal revival to all everyone around you. Because when it's there, you will spread the love of God. And every person you meet will know that you've had an experience with God. And that's really what revival all is. It's the absolute excitement that comes from a person whose heart turns away from where they were to what God is bringing them to today. I'm so glad you joined me today. Listen, make sure you go see us on Facebook, download the show notes, and I'll see you next week. Until then, don't forget, be the one. Do you want to know more about Revival? Listen, I have the answer. Our team here has developed a website that you need to take advantage of. All you need to do is go to RevivalRadioTV.com. It works on your iPad. It works on your mobile phone. If you've got a smartphone, you can go to that. I want to tell you something really cool. There's a feature on there. It's called the timeline. And in this timeline, you can scroll through history. You can literally scroll through history and see what happened. For instance, here is, uh, here's about the Assemblies of God. Here's about the mission that happened. Here's about Russian. The, the, and click on that and you can find out more information about revivals. Take advantage of the website. There's nothing better than getting involved and seeing what God did throughout history when it came to revivals and how he messed with everybody's lives, how he took uh, his own Holy Spirit and dropped it in and totally changed lives. Listen, you wanna go to the website, revivalradiotv.com and learn more about it.